Welcome everyone. Welcome to the American Citizens Abroad Global Foundations webinar, Parting the Veil, Analyzing the Revenue Effects of Residence-Based Taxation, or RBT, with our panelists, Charles Bruce, who is an executive director of the ACA Inc., which is the advocacy organization, and he is also the chairman of ACA Global Foundation. And Mike Udell, who is the principal from District Economics Group, DEG. I'm uh, Mary Louise Serrato, I'm the executive director of ACA. And before launching into the formal introduction of our panelists and a little background and bio information on them, I wanna just um, do a little bit of housekeeping. So number one, thanks um, to everyone who has joined uh, this webinar. We really appreciate your participation. We do our best to try to reach as many um, uh, overseas Americans as, as possible. We understand that for some of you, um, the timing wasn't perfect, but um, just know that the webinar will be made available online. So if you know people who were not able um, to view live, we certainly will have that um, available online. Um, so, Julie, can you put the housekeeping slide up so I can walk through? Ah, so we have about a 50-minute presentation, and we will be following with a 10-minute Q&A. And your questions, there is a question box on the mm -hmm. webinar tool. You can put your questions in there, and we will answer them at the end of the <clears throat> end of the presentation. Perhaps uh, a question or two might actually uh, get answered during the presentation, depending on um, the material that's presented. If your question is not um, answered, uh, please do send it to us at info at acaglobalfoundation.org. You can see uh, that address at the bottom of the welcome list. Obviously, nothing that's said in this webinar should be treated as legal or accounting advice. Um, the speakers will try to identify when they are <clears throat> presenting their own views as opposed to views of ACA and ACA GF. So I think with that, um, we've got all the housekeeping taken care of. Uh, one last thing, um, attendees are on mute, so obviously you won't be able to speak. Um, and, and again, it's the question uh, box where you can send your questions and send, send your comments. So I'd like to just um, put up the bios of uh, the panelists. I'm the executive director of ACA very quickly. I've been with ACA almost 20 years. My background is in marketing and public relations. And I am assisted here in Washington, D.C. by Julie Sanford, our administrative director. And she is doing all the technical backup um, for this um, webinar and many, many thanks to Julie uh, for doing all the technical back end. Charles Bruce, as I mentioned, is the chairman of ACA Global Foundation. He's also legal counsel of ACA. He is a US tax lawyer and practices in Washington, DC, London, and Lausanne. He has an extensive background um, in tax. He served as tax counsel at the United States Senate Finance Committee, vice chair of the American Bar Association of Taxation Committee on Foreign Activities of International Treaties and I might have skipped the line there, sorry. Um, Committee on Foreign Activities of U.S. Taxpayers, Chair of the ABA Task Force on International Trusts, and um, uh, he's also a visiting profession, professor <clears throat> at uh, some of the universities here in the U.S. and overseas. So you can see Charles comes with an extensive background um, and knowledge and tax. And Mike Udell, who um, is the founder and managing <clears throat> principal of DEG, District Economics Group, which is the economic consulting firm here in Washington, DC. You can see that uh, Mike started his career in federal tax policy in 1985 at the IRS, doing a lot of work on estimating the tax gap and the Taxpayer Compliance Measurement Program. Um, he also worked with uh, worked at the um, uh, Joint Committee on Taxation (JCT), uh, providing revenue estimates for federal tax legislation. Um, 
Mike has also worked at um, Ernst & Young, uh, where he launched the firm's practice in medical device excise tax. He founded District Economics Group in 2013 to better serve his clients with federal legislation and policy issues. So Mike comes with an extensive background um, as well in tax and in, um, in, in revenue estimating and research. Um, there, Mike also has um, a, a, a fantastic, excellent team um, that helps him out here in Washington, D.C., Lori Stuntz and Danielle um, Sacken. I won't read through their bios, but they will be available on um, the presentation um, uh, slides that are will be later available online on the website. So I think um, that covers uh, everyone's bios. So with that, I will turn it over to Charles to start the presentation. Very good. Thank you. Uh, I think I'm not muted. Good. So everybody should be able to, to hear me. So uh, let's start with uh, what are we talking about here? What's the subject of this, uh, of this webinar? So what we're going to do is we're going to be talking about analyzing the revenue effects of RBT. And this subject is absolutely, absolutely key to learning how to structure RBT and how to effectively push for its enactment. The details really lead to everything. Um, participants can take a quick look by going to the uh, ACA website at a side-by-side -side analysis of the existing provisions and what might have to be changed, so and so forth and so on. Um, but we're not going to get into that right now. Um, but you can look at it. In fact, I recommend you do look at it. Past work. We went di deeply into this subject in, uh, in 2017. And right after um, um, that deep dive, we went around and made some adjustments uh, that were extremely um, um, useful. Um, and on that particular exercise, I think, uh, Mike, you worked on it for about something like five months and then intensely towards the end of uh, 2017, presenting the information all over Capitol Hill and at Treasury Department. There, uh, why come back to it? Well, because a lot has happened uh, in, the, in the interim and Mike is going to go into that in some greater detail. Very important developments that people I think will be very interested in. Um, there is general agreement about the need for RBT. We've not run into anybody up on Capitol Hill on Treasury Department who have come to, a, who have said back to Mary Louise, let's say, this is the dumbest idea we've ever heard of, we shouldn't do it. No, there's general uh, agreement that it, is, uh, that, it, that it is a good idea. And in fact, my own personal view is that I think a lot of people on Capitol Hill and Treasury Department and IRS actually expect this to happen sooner or later. And uh, what we want to do is make it sooner. Um, the general agreement, the, 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 there has in recent months have been a, uh, a coalition formed by um, groups who just came together. Um, and people should take a look at that, at that. Just Google RBT coalition and you'll see what's going on and how many members and who they are as of today. The, uh, there is also not only general agreement that RBT is a good idea, but there's a general agreement that RBT should be revenue neutral, tight against abuse, and no one really made worse off by going to RBT and moving away from the regular, the, the current system. Again, numbers are key, uh, absolutely key. It is not the case, not the case in my opinion, I think it's safe to say not the case in the ACA's opinion, that this can be done simply with the argument that it's the right thing and it's fair. Um, all that is true, and we deeply believe in it, but just saying it's fair uh, is not going to win the day. Revenue analysis really hones in on the subject of revenue estimates and whether RBT can be made revenue neutral, which we've said is uh, critical. Now then, as soon as we turn to the to the, 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 the details of this, I'm instantly over my head. And Mike, I'm looking at you. Please help us out. Thanks, Charlie. Um, 
Good afternoon, everyone. It's still the morning here on the East Coast, but I, I suspect everyone it's the afternoon. Um, my name is Mike Udell. I'm the head of District Economics Group, and we're an economic consulting boutique that specializes in federal tax legislation. And so I want to explain what our role is with American citizens abroad. We, we're sort of an un, unusual boutique in that our main client never pays us. Our main client, the people who we need to most impact, are the congressional budget scorekeeping people. Uh, when we're effective communicating with them, it generally greatly improves the chances of legislative success for our client. And so our role with American citizens abroad is to present an a non-advocacy objective set of measures of the economic and tax issues associated with RBT. And those issues are going to change as the particular, uh, what Charlie calls the dials and knobs in the RBT proposal, as those various thresholds and tests for RBT and um, as, as they change in the legislative process. So our role is to manage the budget scorekeeping side of the project. And why is that important? It's important because budget scorekeeping is, a, is an arcane subject that is a absolute necessity on Capitol Hill for legislation to move forward. Budget scorekeeping, and this will I'll just be as brief as I can, is a process where congressional committees uh, keep track of changes in revenues and changes in spending as a result of a legislative proposal. It's like having a scorecard. And every piece of legislation that is voted out of a committee or off of a floor, either House or the Senate, or through a conference committee on its way to final passage in the Congress, at each of those stages, there is a budget scorecard on all the various provisions in the bill. And the reason we're involved with this project is to help ACA craft the right version of an RBT that satisfies the needs of ACA and also results in a budget score that makes it a viable legislative proposal. And the basic idea there about viability is, is that the more a legislative proposal costs in terms of losing revenue or creating more spending, the greater that is, the more challenging it is for members to get behind it because it means they have to spend political capital rallying other members to, to vote for that proposal. And that, that's the real challenge because in Congress, believe it or not, um, there is a sort of a zero sum game in the budget scorekeeping space. So not every member can have every proposal that they would like because the budget scorekeepers come back and say all this stuff costs too much. And at some point, the committee chairman say, no, we're not going to we're not going to include this proposal. So while Charlie has mentioned several times that the need for revenue neutrality, the, the, the point of that is, is that our role is to help manage the legislative proposal so that it gets to revenue neutrality, because that will greatly increase the chances of the of the proposal being included in legislation that goes forward. So that's our role, and it's it's an unusual role because usually you would think of a lobbyist as being a, an all-out advocate, making uh, public statements and helping members make public statements. And in fact, that's not our role. We We work behind the scenes because our biggest client is a group that does not want public statements. Our biggest client does not pay us are these budget scorekeepers. And our job is to be really credible with them. And as a indicator of how that works, the budget scorekeepers on Capitol Hill are inundated with thousands of legislative proposals each year. They have to score them. And the more nuanced a legislative proposal is, the less time the budget scorekeepers will have to develop uh, an understanding of it. In the case of RBT, that's especially true. The data are really not there to do a good analysis of all the RBT 
that the budget scorekeepers have, we have access to actually much more data uh, or we use much more data than they do. And so when we present to them about RBT, they're all ears. And as they understand our presentations and the data that we develop, and we will provide them that data, we then know where this proposal is going to land in terms of the budget scoring. And that's our job. Our job is to come back and tell Charlie, we think this, this version is revenue neutral, and it may come back from the Joint Committee on Taxation that you know, it maybe loses 30, 40, 50 million, which is rounding error in congressional budget scorekeeping parlance. And that's great. <laughs> You know, they're never going to take exactly our number, but we know what, what this is going to turn out to be. So that's our role here. It's a very objective role, and it's, believe it or not, it's a non-advocacy role, okay? So let me just quickly then review what is budget scorekeeping. Congress, through the Congressional Budget Office, has a 10-year projection starting with the next fiscal year, 2022, all the way through 2031 of what the government's going to take in in terms of revenues and what the government's going to spend in terms of spending programs. That's called a baseline. Budget scorekeeping is looking at a legislative proposal and understanding how it would change the revenues or the spending in the baseline. That change over the 10-year budget period is the score. And so that our job is to is to help get that uh, that score down to the a small a number while keeping the pieces of the RBT proposal that are important intact. All right. So um, those are those are the key things about budget scorekeeping, and I just wanted to make sure people understood what our role is here. And as you'll see, it's a fairly non-public role. Uh, it's because we really don't want our data baselines out in the public before the budget scorekeepers have actually had a chance to score a proposal. We don't want to front run them. We want to get them to the right to sit the right result. All right. So that's our role. And I'll tell you just a little bit now about the work that we've been doing for ACA. When when ACA uh, brought us on board in back in 2017, we very quickly realized that there there was really a lack of data both in the tax system and overall um, about how many U.S. citizens reside overseas. Uh, it's really a hard number to figure out. That's a good thing for us because if it's that difficult to figure out, that means that the congressional budget scorekeepers don't have an idea either, all right? So what we did is we developed um, an approach that uses a number of different data sets and sort of triangulates the size of the U.S. residents U.S. citizens who are resident overseas. To our knowledge, that was the first baseline estimate ever done in the economics literature. And we provided that baseline of the number of U.S. Uh, citizens resident overseas to the Joint Committee. It was in the area of five, five and a half million people, all right? To get to that number, we used a lot of data sets. We used data sets from the United Nations on uh, migrants in uh, in each country and those data sets usually rely on counts of visas issued that are residency type visas not tourist visas we used a lot of the tax return data both the earned income tax the 2555 form the foreign tax credit form the 1116 form uh, we used another form that basically addresses outbound payments from the United States to a foreign entity. Those get reported on a tax form called the 1042S. And it also tells us the extent of withholding and the, the character of the income. We use data from the Social Security Administration on how many of their payments are outbound and to where. We use um, data from a few papers from the Office of Personnel and Management about the number of federal employees and federal contractors that are posted overseas because they're still, they're, they're not residents overseas. If you're involved with U.S. government and you're posted overseas, you're still considered a U.S. resident for the most part. So we used a lot of these data to figure out how much the information system could see 
of US residents overseas. And then we compared to that to this UN data about um, basically about visa registrations. And there's a big gap. The UN data shows a lot more people than the uh, than these other separate data systems. Best example is in this in Mexico. UN data shows three quarters of a million US citizens resident in Mexico. We get maybe 12,000 tax returns a year from US citizens resident in Mexico. That's, that's an enormous disparity. Um, for the most part, for many countries, um, there actually is a very stable relationship between all of the ways we can see US citizens resident overseas in tax information and the data from the United Nations for each country. Uh, and that, that stability is, a, is, is really broad based out of the 130 countries where we're doing this crossing matching of tax system data to UN migrant data. I would say out of the 130, probably 90 of those countries have almost the exact same relationship between number people on a tax return filed from overseas that are not in the US government, that are not US uh, federal government employees. And what the UN says is the migrant stock. And that ratio in our data was about three and a half to one, which, which means that that's, that's a lot. On an average US tax return, we have about 1.9 people per return, uh, averaged across single filers and married filing joint. And when we then get to three and a half, to one in our measure, that tells us there's a fairly large number of folks who are not uh, filing tax returns as we can see it. And there's a lot of reasons for that. We, you know, and, and it's not non-compliance. So a lot of it is the US government employees or contractors overseas. So we, we subtract those folks out. Uh, there's a fairly large chunk of US citizens overseas who were, who were born overseas but because of their parents, they're US citizens. Christian Pulisic, the great soccer player, is, is a good example. He's a US citizen, but he was born in Germany. Um, now, his hand is raised because I'm sure he has to file a tax return. It's hard, it's hard to be uh, quiet if you're Christian Pulisic. But this situation happens a lot. There's almost a half a million in our data uh, U.S. citizens who are born overseas, so they're not showing up in the U.N. data on migrant because they're not, they don't have a visa. They are, they were born in that country and they still remain there. So that's a large number of, of folks too. So what we did is first try to create the most comprehensive profile of this. Regardless of what the RBT proposal is, we needed to create what's the, what's the best picture of overseas people and that are US citizens. And then we begin to separate out the various groups, tax return filers, uh, born overseas, federal government employees or contractors. And then we, 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 we estimate these various pieces and come up with a residual. And the residual is what we're calling non-filers. And that's, that's a, a kind of a technical term in the tax policy community. Doesn't, it doesn't mean they're bad. It just means they're people who are not represented on a tax return that it was filed to the US that we can see. And that's important because when we speak to budget scorekeeping analysts in Congress, that's their data set. They, their comfort zone is looking at a tax return, right? And this issue space is a lot larger than that. And so for us to be able to develop a bigger picture and explain it to them is a real plus for ACA because we are a welcome presenter both up on Capitol Hill to the budget scorekeepers, to the Treasury Department, to their economic an analysts, because we're, we're, we're showing them something that they didn't know and that they would like to know about. So that's, that's our basic process. It takes time. Um, we end up chasing down a few blind alleys because we'll think a data set is relevant. And then all of a sudden we, we realize in the construction of the data that in fact, it's, it's got too much noise and we can't use it. Because we want to create a data profile that is also going to be credible with budget analysts. And those are 
federal government employees. And so they, they actually have their own biases, <laughs> not surprising, about what is good data and what is not. And that bias basically goes tax return data, federal government surveys, analysis of federal government employees, say from the Department of Defense or the Office of Personnel Management, where we can get some post of duty information, all right, uh, which also gives us family size, which is really useful. Um, all the way down to a survey on voting behavior of US citizens overseas, right, towards, towards the bottom. And so we have a very keen eye on what kind of information is really relevant to the scorekeepers, both in Congress and at the Treasury, because we want them to, in the end of the day, we want them to use our baseline to analyze this, 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 the, the proposal that will come out. So that's the main job that we do. We, in 2017, we did what I would call a first turn of the crank. We had to first figure out how to do this. And so we did it with um, a reduced number of countries and then expanded that, uh, did some statistical work to expand it out to the US population. In this project that we're working on now, we already done the proof of concept. So what we're doing now is greatly expanding out the actual countries included in the data set and the actual countries where we're matching up and then refining a few countries that have really big mismatches between what the United Nations says are US citizens who have migrated to a country and what the tax system says are tax returns coming from those countries. And it's, it's uh, Mexico's the biggest issue, uh, but there are a number of countries where the, the, uh, the imbalance is, is huge. Those countries include Greece, Poland, um, you know, not, apart from Mexico, not enormous. A country like Canada, where there are enormous number of tax returns filed from U.S. citizens, Canada looks like most other countries in terms of the relationship between the U.N. data and the tax system data. Um, but there are a few countries that, and so we need to explain and understand what that, that difference is. Um, in some countries, we have <laughs> we have fewer people in the UN data than we actually have tax returns for. Uh, I think in Hong Kong and in Singapore, we have more tax returns than we actually than the UN says are U.S. citizens who who are not tourists who are resident there. But it's not a large amount. So another part of our data system after we uh, try to measure people is, we then try to figure out the income profiles and try to then estimate how much of their income is US source and how much of their income is foreign source. We spend a lot of time on that. There's a lot of tax return information on that. Um, and then we then roll in, what is the interplay with section 911 on those tax returns and on that those amounts of income? And then what are the various tax rates for the countries that these returns come from? So sort of as a, as a tidbit here, from the data, we can see about 10% of tax returns filed from US citizens overseas are, are from countries that don't have an income tax. So there's a 0% individual income tax, and they account for about 12 or 13% of the total income reported on tax returns for US citizens who are resident overseas. So how, how RBT is going to deal with those folks um, is something I know that people are, are kind of wondering about. I wouldn't call these countries tax havens. Tax havens really are um, a pretty pejorative term in the tax compliance space about countries that are bad actors. Having a 0% tax rate does not necessarily make you a bad actor. Um, it, may be an, it may be that the country doesn't need an individual income tax. Texas is not a bad actor, but they don't have an individual income tax. Washington state does not have an individual income tax. So it's not, um, it's not an indicator of a tax haven to have a 0% tax rate. So that's a, I know people have 
sort of brought that issue up. I don't think that's a terribly big issue for RBT. Um, well, it is in terms of how much U.S. tax would be foregone in the future. But as I said, it's about 10% of what's reported now. Uh, so uh, beyond that, we then really try to understand this this issue of uh, non-filers. And non-filers is really not a big issue, you would think, for you folks, you know, you know um, but for talking to budget scorekeeping people on Capitol Hill, they're keenly interested in people who do not file tax returns who, who they believe should. And so we have to address it because it's something we know they're going to be interested in. And so we do spend some time in our materials trying to estimate, well, how many U.S. citizens resident abroad simply don't show up on tax returns? And it's in the area of, uh, of the five, 5.2 million U.S. citizens resident abroad, it might be a million, a million and a half, all right? Um, we're going to refine that estimate in this round. So it, that doesn't, generally there's not much revenue there in the non-filer space, and I think the, um, the budget score keep, people know that. Revenue, I mean, if they had a way to bring in non-filers uh, to the tax system, that it might improve tax compliance. It certainly would always improve tax compliance, and that's a that's a policy plus for the proposal. But it may not have hardly any effect whatsoever on actual revenue raised. Um, it's just that bringing people into the tax system who should be there is always a plus for congressional budget analysts because it's a positive policy point. So that's why we do spend some time trying to figure out who isn't filing a tax return and why. All right. So that's a part of our analysis as well. When we do this, we, we create year-by-year -year estimates. They're really detailed. They go down to how much ordinary income, how much capital gain income, how much passive income is earned in the United States, is U.S. sourced, how much is foreign sourced, and that's, of course, very helpful because in an RBT system, the foreign source component is not going to be subject to U.S. tax. The U.S. piece would remain subject to U.S. tax. Uh, and so it's important to sort of get a really good handle on, on how much those numbers are and where they might go in an RBT system. And RBT presents some big incentives for employees of U.S. companies to increase postings overseas. Um, it takes a while to get to RBT. You can't move overseas and in one year become RBT. There's a, there's a waiting period where you've got to be overseas. So it's really important to get these um, detailed income profiles, as detailed as we can get from tax return information, to help the budget scorekeeping people understand this income is going to remain in the U.S. tax system and that income is going to uh, be removed from it because it's uh, overseas, it's foreign sourced income. And then we try to help them understand, well, what would be the utilization rate of RBT? Would everybody want to use RBT? And in some cases, um, people would not want to elect RBT. Uh, because the current system might be a better situation for them. They might be young in their career. They might feel that they don't need to do this and they could remain in the U.S. system, especially if they have uh, a beneficial tax treaty. So we have to sort of work on all these moving pieces and try to articulate them and how they would be used. And that's gonna depend on where the thresholds are in the RBT proposal. And so that's what we work with Charlie on a great deal, so that, and then pr discuss with budget scorekeeping staff so that we can begin to understand where the budget scorekeepers believe there's sensitivity in the proposal that we need to address or ACA needs to address in the proposal to, to keep the budget score constrained. And so 
part of our our role here is to facilitate those discussions with the budget scorekeeping staff. And um, Charlie's actually really good at having discussions anyway with Treasury people and Hill people. But we help with the, just the budget scoring folks because we want to learn where is the Achilles heel in the proposal where the budget score people, people are going to say, your RVT proposal costs billions, which, which would be a deal killer. And so we would need to modify the proposal. So that's an important role that we're playing here. Um, I just, I don't know if, um, if uh, there are other questions, I kind of wanted to stop there and see if Mike, Mike it makes sense. Mike, I might um, uh, throw just a couple of things um, at you based on what you said and some notes I've taken. Uh, I'm not going to jump around a little bit. Um, how many people like you are there? <laughs> a funny question, but uh, uh, I've noticed uh, in Washington, I've done this for a while, there are pockets of people, uh, um, um, economists, who are doing this sort of subject. They seem to be a couple of places on Capitol Hill, a couple of places in, in Treasury Department, IRS. And when, when we go around, you, me, Mary Louise, we go around, and when we go around together, it seems to me you know these people. It's like a floating bridge club. Um, can you talk about that? Uh, that's, a, that's a good point. Um, the number of economists in DC is, 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 a, is a large telephone book. Uh, it's smaller than the number of attorneys in DC, but the number of economists is quite large. But the number of economists that do budget scoring is fewer than 60. And uh, it's a small crowd. The staff at the Joint Committee on Taxation is 25 economists, 25 attorneys, 25 economists. The staff at the Treasury Department that does budget scoring is even smaller. It's, you know, there might be 15 people in that revenue estimating shop. And so those are those people are the audience for us. So we're we're really talking to people who are doing the scorekeeping, creating that legislative scorecard that follows a bill through committee, through floor action, and and measures each proposal in the bill. That's mm -hmm. our audience. And so I've spent my entire career with that audience. I was at the Joint Committee from 1991 to 2008, and Laurie, who works with me, was at the Joint Committee from 2007 to 2019. And so we have this extensive set of connections with these budget scorekeeping staffs, and that really improves our access. They always want to talk to us, and they're always glad for us to come in. At the also, same let me, time, let me, let, me, let me add something to those people um, that work uh, at the Treasury and, uh, and Joint Committee, mainly the Treasury uh, people. They aren't. They don't just be. They're not just impartial on what they're doing because they will lean forward, look at the numbers, and then talk with their compadres as to what is going to move ahead in legislation. And they will say, No, no, no. You don't want to do that because these numbers are not going to be good. Or they will say. Yes, yes, yes. I think we can make this fly. So um, I wanted to uh, talk about the population a little bit. Uh, in um, you'll kill me for this. In um, in um, thirty seconds, can you say something about reconciliation? Yes, that's a that's a great point. So I mentioned at the beginning that there's this budget scorekeeping scorecard that follows every bill uh, through committee and floor action through the conference and then is passed by the Congress. Reconciliation is a set of congressional rules that sits atop a bill as it travels through committee. And it says, this bill can cost no more than $10 of revenue and needs to raise $15 of revenue. And so those instructions from the Reconciliation Committee absolutely create the revenue table as a zero-sum game. That revenue scorecard must balance to those instructions. If, they, if the bill does not, then any member of Congress on the floor or the House or the Senate can just simply raise a point of order and the bill will go down it, it, because it will violate reconciliation. The benefit of 
having a bill travel through reconciliation instructions is that in the Senate, it's a simple majority. It's a 51 vote majority. TCJA passed with 51 votes. Um, so in a, in a tightly uh, contested Senate split, any big bill that's going to be a, a revenue or a spending measure is almost for certain going to have to travel through reconciliation. And we expect reconciliation to happen end of September, right. maybe even late, early October. We expect mm -hmm. that to happen. Yeah. So um, thank you for, for that. Um, um, next point, then, I'm gonna, then we're gonna go to these questions, uh, um, many good questions, but so that we not lose track of it. Uh, you mentioned that uh, the compliance numbers, the numbers of non-filers, all of that um, um, subject is a real hot subject in Washington. In fact, there was a recent hearing devoted just to that. And as a subset of that subject, it is so-called offshore non-compliance. I do believe that you are one of the most knowledgeable people on the numbers in uh, so-called offshore non-compliance, because looking at your bio, you almost started off with that subject. I did. And I'm going to guess, I don't want to speak out of school. I don't think I want to speak out of school. The, uh, that I think um, DEG has, been, has gone into that space, I like that term. You've gone on into that space again and again. Say just a few words about how hot a topic, um, compliance and offshore um, non-compliance, all of that is. Great. Um, I'm going to give you two comments about that. One I think you'll expect, and the other one is, is well, why is that important? So the first one is what you would expect. The congressional budget analysts and the Treasury Department have always been interested in large pockets of non-compliance. The whole reason there's an FBAR system and the, the whole reason there's FATCA is because of a, a, a perceived and then discovered offshore non-compliance scheme. So the federal tax policy community has been keenly always interested in pockets of non-compliance that are not small, that are essentially could hemorrhage. And the tax code is filled with just tax provisions that do nothing but try to shut down a set of transactions that would create non-compliance, all right? Um, both domestic and foreign. So this year, there's heightened interest in non-compliance, both because of the work of former commissioner Charles Rosati and his series of proposals on improving the IRS, which the administration has embraced as the increase in the IRS budget, the increase in IT spending of the IRS, those kinds of things. Um, so there's there's just always been a keenly interested part about tax policy. That's the part you would expect. The part that you wouldn't expect, and I, we we try to stay away from it, uh, is that separate from this whole conversation, uh, beginning around 2011, 2012, a number of economists, uh, Piketty, Saez, um, began to write about inequality in the world. And lo and behold, they've discovered in their writing and their analysis that inequality in the world has to do with offshore non-compliance. <laughs> and so that has become a hot political topic, but less so for budget analysts. They would love to be able to shut down um, some what in tax haven kind of structures, for the most part, I don't think that's an issue for, for RBT at all. I don't think it's it's really going to be a risk. Um, and we can talk about why it won't be a risk. Um, so those are the, the two issues. And we are, of course, keenly aware of the literature and have a lot of discussions with the academics in that space. Uh, but we are a non-advocacy shop, so we don't take positions on that kind of stuff. We just try to understand who, how people are measuring it. Okay, let's let's turn to some of these qu other questions and see if we can really step on the accelerator here. Um, and I'm not. I'm just going to run down the list. Um, and so this is like uh, you know um, one of those games that you, you have to answer fast. Uh, 
When do you expect the second phase of, uh, of this work, the work we're talking about, the ACA DEG work to be uh, completed? Mike? Yeah, we expect our baseline work to be done um, first, second week in August. And then that will uh, give us uh, a... Yeah, I get a copy of the, uh, of, the work pro <laughs> of the work product. I guess I can uh, answer that. Just as in 2017, DEG uh, produces a, a written analysis, a written report, and the high points are in there. Um, and uh, so um, that's it. The um, people sometimes ask me, don't you have a big spreadsheet that I, you can just send me? And the answer is, this is not a big spreadsheet. This is a huge database. Uh, and, uh, but the results will be, uh, will be, of course, available. Um, bum, 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 bum. Will there be a rule that existing long-term U.S. expats will be covered by RBT without having to do anything? With, uh, in a sense, will they be grandfathered? Um, of course, we don't know until uh, the, 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 the legislation is drafted, but always there has been a grandfather provision in. In the old holding bill, there was, a, there was grandfathering, and that doesn't hurt anybody. Um, everybody expects that a, a big population long-term, real live overseas um, residents will be just moved into RBT. It's elective, so for some reason someone says, no, 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 I don't want to be in a RBT. They can, in a sense, elect out of it. Actually, they have to elect in it, so and, they just don't And to the in. elective part, Charlie, it might be worth mentioning that from a compliance standpoint, it's probably better if that election to be RBT can be an annual election. Yeah. Okay. We won't go to details yet, but um, somebody can uh, follow up on that if they wish to. Um, bum, bum, bum. How would it work um, for people constantly on the move, going from the U.S. to uh, Europe and Europe over to the Far East and back and forth, essentially going wherever their boss tells them to go? Um, how would it work? Uh, uh, that is, and, and would anybody fall be, between the cracks? A lot of attention is given to uh, to making sure that short-termers um, would not uh, fall between the, the cracks. Now then, uh, Mary Louise seems to be leaning in. Do, do you want to add anything on that? Um, no, there were a couple of, um, we've been monitoring the questions and a couple things I thought, um, questions that maybe you might want to touch on. There have been some questions about what is foreign um, sourced income that would no longer be taxed. Do investments in FFIs, are is that going to be considered foreign source are foreign pensions um, that you're required in, in, in some countries to invest in or that you may have invested in. Will those be considered sort of just maybe a hit list of what is foreign source which would be taken out of the taxation regime? Uh, you want me to try that, um, Mike, and then you can correct me. <laughs> right. There are a whole bunch of existing sourcing rules in the code. Um, and so what would you do is look at those existing sourcing rules. If when you look at those existing sourcing rules and move them over to the RBT regime, you think, no, that's not, we're, we're dropping too many people. We have to change, change it. So my guess is that they would generally follow, follow existing sourcing rules. Uh, and then it'd be almost item by item to decide, no, it ought to be a, a, adjusted. Um, for instance, uh, foreign pensions, well, that would probably be foreign. If you, it's, a, if it's a foreign plan, you're, it, that would be foreign source. If, uh, if you've got pension income that comes from having spent a, a long time in New York working there, that, that might be U.S. source. Um, unless people looking at it say, no, we don't want that. And then they'll look down, Michael will look down at, at his, his uh, sheet and say, actually, you can do that. It's not going to blow the number. That's right. where the detail, by the way, is so important. Right. right. So important. Okay, what's next, Mary Louise? Um, there was uh, were a few questions on, in terms of offset, where, um, where, where RBT would be offset. And has any consideration been given to the reduction in the IRS administration? of a taxation of Americans overseas as a potential offset, or maybe you have some other thoughts on, on offsets. So uh, let, me, let me quickly jump in on there. In the budget scorekeeping world, uh, believe it or not, the 
change in the IRS budget by itself actually is not does not result in a, a loss of revenue or a gain in revenue uh, because spending on government resources personnel at the IRS actually is 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 moved off the table for these scorecards that we work on as legislation moves uh, I will say though that there is quite a large movement from the Biden administration, independent of RBT, to expand the staff at the IRS. And um, that that's a train that has left the station, as I would say, and I very much would think some version of an expansion of the IRS is gonna show up in a budget, in a, in a reconciliation bill in the fall. Let me add a nuance. Uh, is it an offset or a pickup um, if RBT and the way it works actually encourages some of those people who have fallen off the table to come yes. back yes. in and become compliant, um, yes. compliance pickup is that a plus? It's a plus on. It's a plus in two ways. It's a plus for revenue on a scorekeeping table. It's not going to be a large amount of revenue, but it's a much larger plus in the policy discussion from the Joint Committee on Taxation to chairman of the ways and means committee chairman of the senate finance committee to say this is a, this is a good thing we should we should support this for its policy and that's actually a really important thing that we that is 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 helps a legislative proposal sort of move along is if the joint committee can say there's actually good policy here they'll convey that to the chairman of those tax committees and that will lessen that will make them more interested in, in including it in their bill. Okay, um, I'm impressed there are a large number of smart questions coming in. I hope we've got some smart answers to some of these. Um, let's see, can I pick out one or two more, uh, Mary Louise, or you want to pick out, a, let me pick out one no, that just- No, um, absolutely, I just um, I saw those two, uh, there were quite a few around that, but go right ahead, pick out. Okay. Um, in no particular order, uh, might there be changes in the rules for estate and gift taxes, not just uh, income taxes? Uh, and the answer, yes, there might be. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, I can't say anything more about that uh, because I don't know, um, but we'll, we will number it. And, uh, and Mike will be able to uh, tell people, you can cover um, 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 estate and gift. Right now, if, uh, if, um, if RBT people moved over to be taxed the same way as non-resident alien individuals are, it would be a revenue pickup, revenue pickup. It may be too big a revenue pickup. So that may need to have, that may need to be uh, shaved a bit here and there. Um, uh, I, I don't think we need to go to, into that anymore right now, but, but it's not an overlooked subject, I can tell you. Would it be possible to do away with FBAR reporting uh, if you go to um, RBT? Mary Louise, that has your name on it. <laughs> so FBAR reporting is really not a tax filing report. It comes out of the financial crimes, um, I probably don't have the name right, unit or FinCEN. Yeah. Enforcement, right. well, thanks Mike. And it's used for uh, tracking uh, drug runners, money launderers, terrorist financing. So we don't envision FBAR going away. Um, it would be a hard lift for a lot of representatives to say, I'm gonna vote against having FBAR reporting and then there is a major drug, drug trafficking effort um, that is uncovered in the United States or a terrorist attack and somewhere someone says, well, had we had that reporting, um, we, could have, we could have stopped this. So we, we don't see that happening. What you also understand, because a lot of people um, conflate uh, FATCA reporting with FBAR and they think that the FBAR reporting is what is causing the problem with foreign financial institutions. And the FBAR is not causing that problem because there is no matching reporting system between the individual taxpayer um, sending in his FBAR report and the bank does, does not report a, a matching report on that. It is the FATCA reporting which causes the banking lockout, and hopefully with RBT, FATCA would no longer be an issue in terms of reporting because that would be foreign sourced income. Next question. 
what do you see as the breakpoints? Who are going to be the, the winners and the losers if you look at RBT? And who might be um, adversely um, um, affected by uh, um, switching to RBT? Uh, in, in my opinion, speaking very generally, the big obvious winners with RBT would be actually the ACA membership. <laughs> it is the long-term, real live uh, expats living overseas. They would be clearly winners under RBT, unless somebody sees a little wrinkle, in which, in which case I'd like them to tell me more about those wrinkles. But in general, uh, the long-term um, uh, uh, residents overseas would be. Um, people who are new to RBT, who decide one day, you know, Southern California is nice, but I'd like to move to someplace else equally pleasant and cash out, blah, blah, blah. That's a special situation. And uh, uh, that cannot, um, that would, would blow out the numbers, uh, I do believe. It needs to be addressed. They, they, they would not be told to go jump in the lake. They would just have to be some special rules cutting back on, uh, on, on, uh, on that. It would be too much of an invitation for uh, abusing the system. That You can always deal with that. And Mike and his numbers is actually key to that. Um, how long yeah. would you have to, how long would you have to be in system RBT before you could do that kind of cash out? And what would you do with the assets that you carried with you um, that were, um, that had big gain embedded in them? So right. um, question on winners and losers, um, long-term um, 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 expats, clearly winners, unless somebody has a tiny little question, they want to, a point they want to bring to my attention, I would love to hear about it. Uh, let's see. Um, do 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 do. Um, let's. I have to cruise down a little bit. <clears throat> do 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 do. In uh, in in what way is the existence of RBT coalition being used in ACA's contacts with Congress? Mary Louise. So the RBT coalition um, really has come together just in support of residence-based taxation. The group doesn't support any particular approach to residence-based taxation, but is just showing support for, for RBT. And this is hugely important and hugely beneficial to our visits to Congress because it shows that not only, this is not just an issue that ACA and ACA Global Foundation is talking about and other overseas advocacy organizations representing Americans overseas, but it is widespread. It is coming from the business community. It is coming from people involved in relocation. It's coming from a lot of sectors. It's coming from other tax advocacy organizations. And it really shows that there is broad support for this. And this is not just a niche issue. And it, that really helps our advocacy. And, and Mary Louise, I just want to add on to that, that what's changed between 2017 and today is the passage of TCJA. And TCJA was really the the brick in the wall that fell out of the US worldwide tax system that actually helps from a policy perspective, RBT. And that's because corporate income tax today is closer to territorial and RBT is a territorial tax system for individuals. So from a policy perspective, this is actually a much easier conversation now than it was back in 2017. I think that's a terribly important point. Thank you for uh, for making it. Um, TCJA is really a leg up for RBT. Um, also, I'll get off this subject very quickly, but the the focus on compliance may be a leg up uh, also because Americans overseas overwhelmingly are uh, are compliant, and uh, and uh, people I think know that. Let's see. Um, uh, do, 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 do. Timing, how soon might this be taken up? Uh, you mentioned a little bit about the timing of stuff. Um, I see every, things change daily, absolutely daily. Today, I think it's, it's clearer that there is going to be a, there's going to be a big um, um, tax bill. It's going to address, it's going to go back into TCJA. That's not the presentation that a lot of people like to make, but uh, it's going to go back into that uh, um, um, subject. 
it's probably going to be done under reconciliation. And uh, so uh, in the, between now and the end of this Congress, it's going to be a busy, busy time, and we have to look for tar targets of opportunity, either a big bill that includes a lot of corporate stuff, or a, a different bill that uh, really goes strongly into uh, compliance. Either one of those could be vehicles for RBT. What do you think, Mary Louise? Um, sorry, I was answering a question in, in the question box, and I, I'm sorry, I missed your question to me. I'll, I'll, I'll give the answer because I've heard you say it before, and that is that you think that there will be legislation on the big corporate bill, and there may also be compliance, uh, and they both of them are targets of opportunity uh, for us. We need really to lean, stay close to that uh, process. Um, coming down further. How realistic is it to um, how realistic is it to have RBT legislation drafted and voted? Um, blah blah. blah. Cynic cynically, come down a little further. How can the Congress and Senate um, care about offshore U.S. citizens who don't vote and have no representation? Mary Louise. Um, they. First of all, Americans overseas can have representation. A lot of individuals don't understand that they can actually vote from overseas. Um, even if they have been born overseas, um, many of them can use, I, I don't know exactly how many states, I might misstate this, but I think there are about 36 states that allow Americans who are born overseas to use the address of their US parent. Um, last residential address. Um, so that's one way for some Americans, but then obviously there are Americans who don't, um, who, who don't have a parent, but if they were born in the United States, wherever that address, that last address where they lived in the United States, that is their voting address. So they do have um, a voice into Congress. And Congress is um, concerned and interested about Americans overseas and, and the problems that this pre represents for compliance. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have a, a large number of, uh, of questions um, from a very uh, active uh, participation uh, population. Um, we're not going to get to all of these, but we will answer all of them, um, and we'll get get back to uh, whoever the um, posed the uh, the question. Um, I think I think that we should then move to a sort of wind up, and then Mary Louise, I'm going to su suggest you you bring us to a uh, to a conclusion here of the of the uh, of the event, and then you can decide whether um, we can say. Uh, goodbye to the people who want to sign off, uh, and we can um, go on just a bit for people who are uh, gluttons for cup punishment and want to stay want to stay and listen. Uh, Mike has already said that he's, uh, he's available, uh, I'm available. So why don't you wind it up, but we'll leave the, door, leave the door ajar. Absolutely, well thanks to everyone who's attended. I, we can see that we had really great attendance people um, stuck through it and obviously you can you can see and hear how important this research and data collection really is to adoption of residence based residence based taxation so we encourage everyone to even though we've met our goal hooray hooray we've raised our our 75,000 for the second um, a round of, of, of data and research with, um, with Mike and District Economics Group. Um, there's a lot of work you can see from being on this webinar that still needs to be done. A lot of knocking on doors. Um, most definitely there'll be more follow-up research and data that we, we are in, um, going to engage in and, and wanna, wanna dig even deeper. So please, please, please continue to donate. Um, consider becoming a sustaining donor. Um, ACA and ACAGF are primarily a volunteer organization, and we really rely on membership um, fees and donations to to support our work. You can um, I'm going to say this, you know, tip our hat a little bit. We are really the only 
um, nonprofit, nonpartisan, Washington DC based organization that is really involved in the kind of data and research work um, that is necessary to push this, uh, push, push RBT and push legislation ahead. So please, please, please continue to support us. Again, if we don't get to your questions, we can stay on maybe another um, 10 minutes or so. We'll try to get to more questions. But if we don't get to your question, please don't just leave it in the chat box. Send it to info at acaglobalfoundation.org or info at americansabroad.org. And you can find those um, emails on our website, but um, certainly jot them down, send your question, and we will get back to you. And again, thanks everyone um, for participating. Whoever would like to stay on for another few minutes, um, please feel free. And uh, thanks again for everyone who's um, signing off. Very good. All right. So we'll draw a breath and uh and um i'm going to try to uh pick out a few questions and um mary louise and mike um hmm uh help me there's a question here a few americans living abroad think that cbt is more beneficial to them than uh, rbt would be if this could sometimes be the case, could you please explain to, to what cases this would apply and how it works? Well, to tell you the truth, I, I'm not real good explaining um, how someone would be worse off under RBT. Um, uh, it, it is, in a sense, uh, elective. Um, I guess if I had to, somebody said, give me an answer or I'll hit you on the noggin. Um, uh, I would say, well, maybe um, maybe the child child credit uh, benefit, uh, they're, they're benefiting from the relatively new child credit, uh, and they don't want to lose that, I'm assuming that they would lose it under CBT. CBT hasn't been written, but I'll make a guess that they, they might lose it if they're RBT. Um, so um, maybe something like that. Um, I, can't, I can't think of any more, but if anybody who is listening, or was listening, um, uh has examples real live examples i would love to see them um uh okay um mary louise uh why don't you you do one and i'll do one you're next uh so looking three uh looking through sorry um mm. let me see um how will people residing in tax havens um, be treated? I think Mike, you might have mentioned something on that, but um... yeah. So um, you know, there are today there are you know, as I said, about 10% uh, of the uh, foreign source income from U.S. taxpayers who are reside overseas is in countries that have a, a, do not have an income tax, and um, under RBT, that that um that income wouldn't be subject to uh us tax that's that's part of the revenue loss that has to be addressed in the in the legislative proposal um it, it, there's no special rule as, that we've been working on at all to say if you're in vanuatu uh you get a different rule than everybody else in rbt uh, so it's not, RBT is not tied to any OECD concept of tax haven or a blacklist. It's just a, it's, it's a, a, a pure play RBT uh, rule. And it just really says you have U.S. source and foreign source income. Your foreign source doesn't get taxed. Your U.S. source remains in the system as it is today. A personal view, looking out my window. By the way, the picture on the first page is looking out my window. Looking out my window, uh, I think there may be special rules for um, for people residing in uh, in uh, in zero tax uh, places, and they may be, make a difference if if the zero tax is uh, you know a Gulf country that uh, is really helpful to the U.S. and so they may make an exception to the exception for a zero tax that is a really useful zero tax. There may be places that um, are viewed as less um, um, useful. Uh, and in the 
thought there would be, we may not want to embrace zero tax for individuals, just as it seems right now, government is tending towards not want, wanting to embrace zero tax for corporations. Um, that's an issue there, and people will have to uh, um, 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 dive into it. But it's not simply, it's, it's not going to be a simple answer. Uh, um, it will get attention. It will get attention, I do believe. Okay, I think I've massacred that question. Um, pick out another one, Mary Louise. So what would happen with PFIC um, mm. under RBT? And maybe um, PFICs are passive foreign investment corporations. Maybe either Charles or Mike, you can quickly give a tutorial on PFICs or what they are for others who may not understand, but. I'll yield to Charlie on that. Oh. <laughs> Got to be some some way with the software to uh, avoid that outcome. The uh, let's see. So uh, foreign foreign source income could benefit from uh, from uh, RBT um, if uh, if the PFIC uh, uh, income could be treated as a, would qualify as foreign source. That would that would obliterate the uh, the, the PFIC uh, a bad outcome. Uh, mm -hmm. I think, I think that's the direction that it would uh, go in. For instance, one other thing I was thinking is uh, if, if people are in RBT and they're investing in U.S. Uh, stocks and bonds, that would be U.S. source. Mm -hmm. But then someone would come along and said, look, I'm going to bundle the same damn thing and list it on the Luxembourg Exchange, and overnight I'm going to make it foreign source, that would solve the problem. And then loving to talk to myself, I said, that's interesting, but I, I think that somebody may, 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 may want to cut off being too cute. Um, so that's the sort of thinking that would be going on. Answer, I think the PFIC um, issues might be solved. Mm -hmm. Next. Um, does the reduced eliminated um, accrual of foreign tax credits carry forward factor in? So golly that's a Say good that. question it's a post tcja question yeah um i think i think um yeah. they there there has to be a relationship between that and uh the moment that not only that you are eligible and elect rbt because at that moment um your carry forward foreign tax credits might have a, they may be in jeopardy. We haven't really thought about this issue. It is a post TCJA issue um, because they may not be, there may not be any foreign source income to apply them to. So that's just speaking off the top of my head. We actually haven't delved into that. It's a good question. Right. It would, I'm sure at one time, it, it will be addressed because one thing that uh, Mike will absolutely guarantee to everybody, very little gets overlooked by a Joint Committee on Taxation and the, uh, and the people in the other revenue uh, uh, tax writing uh, uh, committees. So the, the carryovers and carrybacks um, um, will be um, um, addressed one way or the other. And whether they're frozen and you can come back and pick them up later if you move back into the US, that's sort of nuance on nuance on nuance they'll get into all of it um, to one degree or another. Pick out another one, Maybe make it an easy one. <laughs> make it an easy one. Um, so um, th this might not be an easy one, but it is something that comes up. It's, it's um, sort of a roundabout um, question, but there's always a lot of talk that CBT is unconstitutional. Um, so is CBT unconstitutional? No. And can it be attacked from that angle? I'll let no. Charles. Speaking, speaking uh, personally and showing that I did spend some time in law school, I would say the answer to that is no. I'm happy to debate it with anybody who wants to, uh, you know, come forward. I'll give, come forward, give me your telephone number and I'll call you. What's next? 
So I have one question I think I can answer. Are there statistics regarding how many U.S. citizens abroad are renouncing, and is this because of they feel abused by the tax system? So I think when people renounce, um, there's they they don't necessarily um, want to disclose that they are doing this because of tax purposes, because that's going to make um, the uh, renunciation process. Uh, a, a lot more difficult and a lot deeper. So I don't think there are any published um, statistics that really give a, a reason why people are renouncing. Um, we do have statistics on how many people are renouncing. And Charles, can maybe you can give some, some thoughts on, um, there's certainly some people who are renouncing because um, of, of the tax system, but there are some people who are just renouncing because um, it's, you know, they they just, you know, have discovered they don't particularly want to remain American citizens has nothing to, to do with feeling abused by the system. But I don't know if you have any additional thoughts on that. Uh, well, um, RBT is, uh, um, you're moving from one system to the other. Um, you're, you're not exiting the system. You remain a U.S. taxpayer. You'll be paying tax on the U.S. source income, and you'll probably be filing a very, very short and not unpleasant form claiming uh, claiming the um, um, the RBT. Uh, there will have to be rules about jumping in the system and out of the system, what I call the uh, grasshopper rules. You, you can't, can't jump out, claim RBT, and then decide you really did like California and then move back in again. So there will clearly be um, um, anti-grasshopper rules, as there is with uh, um, exit tax um, applicable to renunciation. Um, there will be, um, people will need to think, uh, do they, do they really want to go, um, um, RBT or not? Um, and there'll be a lot of, uh, numbering out of that, um, of those, um, I issues. A lot of that is personal stuff. Um, my personal view is a lot of the, um, decisions on, uh, uh, on things like renouncing are made by the family and the people not only look at the Internal Revenue Code, they look at their spouse or their partner. They look at their children. They look at the how difficult it was to get their ch child in school. There's a lot of stuff that goes into that uh, into that uh, decision. Uh, I don't know if that's an answer or not, but give me another question. So, as we're sort of winding down, um, this is a, a interesting question, and maybe um, I don't know how much longer you want to want to go on, but. Um, was there something in particular with the 2017 report, the DEG, the work we did with DEG, um, that was criticized uh, uh, criticized to not pursue RBT in the last tax bill? Um, if so, what and how is it being corrected this time around? I, I think essentially why, um, you know, RBT with um, TCJA that was going on at the same time, our great research and numbers, why that just didn't all come together for the perfect storm to uh, bring RBT forward. So, my my answer was was had nothing to do with the um, with the numbers and all of that. What what the reason it didn't get into TCJA, in my opinion, is that people were in, a, in an absolute panic to get TCJA enacted for the corporations. Um, I think that all of us on this call can agree that uh, the amount of time that was given considering the situation of Americans, individuals overseas, was embarrassingly small. Um, it's TCJ a corporate tax bill. It was and... a corporate tax, yeah. yeah. Mike, I'm going to, uh, off of that question, I want to throw back something we sort of zipped through, but I want you to slow down on just just a bit. What has really changed since 2017 that affects what we're doing today? Uh, there's a whole bunch of stuff, and I'd like you to say a little bit more about it. Sure, a few things. Uh, obviously, TCGA changes the policy landscape and makes this uh, an easier conversation because the, the, the federal tax code now has done something like this called territorial taxation or hybrid for the corporate side. Two, and this is just inside the Beltway, inside Joint Committee, Treasury uh, stuff, 
a lot of staff turnover. So we have a whole new group of, of estimators. We still have the senior people at those staffs. So um, it, it's important for us to get back in front of them uh, because there's going to be a new group. And in order to do that, they are going to ask us, well, what's new? Are you just going to say, tell us what you told us four years ago? And the answer is we can't do that because they, there's nothing new. There's no reason for them to listen. So we really need to refresh the entire analysis so that we come in there with a fresh data set, a much larger data set, um, to, to hold their attention because that's, that's important in the legislative process. But there's also a lot of new data. Also, what, what came out of enforcement actions since 2017 to, to right. now, there's a lot of new data that came out of the voluntary disclosure um, program, the Swiss bank enforcement uh, program. There's a lot of, um, uh, of information. And plus the, the, um, the, the big data sets that, uh, that uh, the IRS and Treasury Department, in fact, they just came out with a, a whole new set. Tell us just a 15 seconds about right. that. Right, so the, the key individual tax returns that we use in the analysis, um, they, they only update them every five years. They've just updated them for the most recent data, which is like 2018. Uh, so we were using 2011 or 2012 data in the 2017 analysis. So now we're actually gonna have whole new fresh data. That's really important for talking to budget analysts. Um, and jumping just for a second back to tax havens, the uh, the IRS and the Treasury Department have stared at that data too, uh, and Joint Committee in particular, and they have been impressed by the amount of income that seems to be pegged to uh, a zero tax jurisdiction. They knew there was a bunch of uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of income being located in those jurisdictions. As they ground into the details, I think they were somewhat surprised at the amounts of income in those jurisdictions. Mike, uh, do you know what I'm talking about? Uh, I do, I do. And I have to, I have to give you the, the, the good news and the bad news there, which is at this point, even the most recent data from the Statistics of Income Group at the IRS, they think it's an eye-poppingly large amount. At the same time, there's a lot of double counting going on in this data. And uh, several uh, prof accountant academics have noted that, that so that actually measuring the amount of uh, income sitting in the tax haven countries uh, and who it's attributable to, whether it's attributable to the business side or to individuals, and there's a blur there, that is still a work in progress. But all to say that there's heightened interest in understanding uh, offshore tax noncompliance. And so, RBT has to make sure that it doesn't get caught in that swirl. I don't think, I think, I think that's something that Charles and I need to pay attention to as, as the proposal is de legislations developed uh, to just keep, mm -hmm. keep RBT out of the swirl of Vanuatu, basically. Yeah. Okay. Um, should we head for the door, Mary Louise? Yeah, um, most of the questions I see now, some are coming in They and and they've actually already been, we've had a few more offset questions, they've actually already been answered um, previously. So I would recommend um, that either send that question directly to us or when this is online and you can access the presentation, you'll perhaps get that, that question answered. So again, if your question didn't get answered here, um, send us an email at the two addresses, info at americansabroad.org or info at acaglobalfoundation.org and we will try to get back to you um, with an answer. So thanks again to those of you who stayed on a little longer. Um, we really appreciate your questions. Um, it's really, really helpful um, for us because we have a good understanding of what the community is dealing with. Um, and sometimes you bring things to us that you know we haven't thought about. So again, thank you very much. Keep the questions going. And again, um, if you're not a member of ACA, uh, please consider becoming a member. And uh, please do continue to donate to our efforts because uh, again, we're a primarily all volunteer organization. And this work is, as you can see from this webinar, critical um, to the to the work on residence-based taxation. So many thanks, um, Mike, uh, for taking the time to um, 
to do the webinar with us. Um, and we really appreciate um, all the great work DEG is doing with ACA and your time uh, spent here on the webinar. Many thanks as well to Charles Bruce um, for taking the time uh, to walk us through all of this. Uh, hopefully it was really beneficial for all of you. And um, many, many thanks um, to, the, to the face and voice you don't see, which is Julie Sanford, our administrative director, who really uh, does all the techno technological back end um, for these webinars. And many, many thanks to Julie for, um, for all the work she did um, getting this up and going. So with that, um, I wish all of you a good end of the day, good night, and um, uh, goodbye from Washington, DC. Bye, thank you. Bye-bye.